Are we, are we ready to come to order? Yes. Let's call the meeting to order. Brother Bradley, would you lead us in a word of prayer, please? Henry Paul, thank you for the day. Thank you for every blessing that's ours. Thank you for this country that we live in. Uh, God just guide our leaders in our country, our state, our county, and our city. Just guide us as we make decisions tonight. May we always do what's best for our citizens. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First, I'd like to say welcome to our two new members, yep. Councilwoman Thompson and Councilwoman Edens. Pleasure to have you here. Um, Ms. Barbara, will you call the roll? Bradley. Here. Edens. Here. King. Here. Thompson. Here. Weaver. Here. Wish. Here. The one change I'd like to make on the agenda is moving CCU up uh, first in committee reports. Is that, John, you guys usually take a lot more time, and I do Okay. <laughs> so, so, I thank, that, right? you, thank you. <laughs> so, with that, I'd entertain a motion for approval of the agenda. So moved. Second. Miss Barbara. Edens. Yes. King. Yes. Thompson. Yes. Weaver. Yes. Wish. Yes. Bradley. Yes. After doing that, Mayor. I forgot that we do not have listed with the Parks Advisory Board ordinance to appoint the three people that we were going to appoint. Uh, I would entertain a motion to amend, amend the, the agenda to add the appointees for the Parks Advisory Board. So moved. You have a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Uh, would entertain a motion for approval of the minutes. So moved. Have a second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Under old business, peace out 911 ordinance. I've asked Chief Ross to address the council. Well, let me back up. Ms. Barber, will you, and before you start there, you all have a, a document in front of you. It's uh, proposed procedures, resolutions, and ordinances. Uh, and if the ordinance has an emergency clause on page two, you guys can reference down there where it talks about emergency ordinances, and we're just going to follow that procedure. If that's okay, and we'll adopt that officially later on. So, Ms. Barber, will you? Be it enacted by the City Council of Clarksville, State of Arkansas, an ordinance to be entitled an ordinance adopting proportionate cost share for 911 services and declaring an emergency. Whereas the city of Clarksville is the serious of transitioning the city public safety answering point PSAP to a consolidated PSAP with Johnson County pursuant to Arkansas Code 1210301. Whereas Act 660 of the Arkansas Legislature directs that by January 1, 2022, funding will be available for no more than 77 PSAPs within the state. And whereas consolidation of the city PSAP with the county PSAP will greatly enhance public safety and security, as well as provide for an avenue of lowering fire protection classifications and insurance premiums for all city residents. Whereas the city recognizes the potential shortfall in funding of the consolidated PSAP and acknowledges the financial responsibility of the city. The city of Clarksville acknowledges and supports a cost share requirement not to exceed 60% of the fixed cost between 911 tax-based revenues and actual expense of operating the PSAP. Now, therefore, be it ordained by the City Council of the City of Clarksville, Arkansas, that Section 1, Consolidation of the City PSAP, is in the best interest of all city residents and is approved. Section 2, the City of Clarksville will maintain three positions on the 911 Advisory Board, consisting of one position provided by a delegate of the Clarksville City Council, the Clarksville Police Chief, and the Clarksville Fire Department. Section 3, the City of Clarksville shall appropriate and provide 60% of the fixed cost between 911 tax-based revenues and actual expense of operating the PSAP. Section 4, capital improvement funds of $20,000 will be appropriated and provided by the city for capital improvements of the PSAP in a separate fund maintained by the Clarksville City Clerk. Section 5, the mayor shall be empowered and authorized to undertake such actions necessary 
to factuate the provisions of this ordinance, including entering into an agreement with Johnson County and other local political subdivisions in furtherance of consolidating and operating the PSAP, emergency clause being necessary to maintain the health, safety, and we welfare of the citizens of the city of Clarksville, Arkansas. An emergency is hereby declared to exist, and this ordinance shall take full force and effect immediately after its passage. So we'll open the floor for discussion, and I asked uh, Chief Ross to kind of address particularly the new, the new <coughs> members of the council to bring them up to speed on where we started and how we got here and where we're going long term. Basically, where we got started at on this is in order to lower the city's ISO ratings, we had to meet certain criteria on a protection class report. In order to do that, we've kind of stalled out at the E911. We do, do not have it. Um, we would not be able to get that. Uh, the state will not allow no more PSAPs to go into effect because they're trying to consolidate. So they won't even let us buy the equipment. So in the long run, we save money by not doing it. And with consolidation, we're looking at paying 60% of what's left over after the state funds come in. So roughly, say it's $800,000 and they get $500,000 in, we're gonna pay 180,000 for the year of uh, dispatch services for fire, police, and ambulance. Um, it also streamlines our calls we're right now they're being transferred from 911 to us some get lost some people hang up because they think we hung up on so it's just a constant thing that's costing a lot of time in our service calls um, it'll help with the insurance ratings by lowering that so we can meet our uh, protection class ratings Move for adoption. I'll second. second. Ms. Barber, we call the roll. King? Yes. Thompson? Yes. Weaver? Yes. Wish? Yes. Bradley? Yes. Eggies? Yes. We have an emergency clause in there, Mayor. What was your what was your motion again? Was your motion move, to adopt I it? Move for adoption of okay. the Yep. Then we we'll need a, a motion to declare that emergency exists. Declare that there's an emergency. Second. Ms. Barbara? Thompson? Yes. Weaver? Yes. Wish? Yes. Bradley? Yes. Edens? Yes. King? Yes. Just to make sure, like, I think it hasn't have to be there once the emergency policy is done. Just to It's the ordinance that's done. It's like, just read it one time. Okay. All right. Thank, thanks, you guys. Under 6A, uh, the Hampton easement is open for discussion. I think it just needs an uh, affirmation vote from, from the council. Is, it, is this a, a subdivision or is this just a, for a house? John, do you want to? This is a house of Lake Bundy. Okay. Yeah. It's pretty standard. You guys usually. I make a motion to approve the easement. We have a second. Sir. Ms. Barbara. Weaver. Yes. Wish. Yes. Bradley. Yes. Aiden. Yes. King. Yes. Thompson. Yes. Six uh, B is the ordinance for the. Let's see, make sure to Parks Advisory Board. Ms. Barbara, will you read that ordinance? Be it enacted by the City Council of. Clarksville, State of Arkansas, an ordinance to be entitled, ordinance to amend section 12.04.01 of chapter 12.04 of the Clarksville Municipal Code, whereas the city of Clarksville is the series of amending section 12.04.01 of chapter 12.04 of the Clarksville Municipal Code. Now therefore be it ordained by the city council of the city of Clarksville, Arkansas. Section 12.04.01 is hereby amended to read as follows. 12.04.01 board created by virtue of ordinance number 01-431 the city of Clarksville created a city parks advisory board the initial number of members was set at five members that number shall be and is hereby amended to six members two the remainder of chapter 12.04 shall remain unchanged emergency clause this ordinance being necessary for the effective operation of the city of Clarksville and for the public peace health and safety of the citizens of Clarksville 
An emergency is hereby declared, and this ordinance shall become effective immediately upon passage. Open the floor for discussion, and I'll let Judy and Max kind of answer your questions because they, they have been dealing directly with Kathy and what, what uh, the board is actually asking for. And the way I understand it, they're just looking for more involvement from each yes. sport mm -hmm. yes. to try to And that was the reason for increasing the numbers to, to six. From and five. there's often times when they have their board meetings that everyone can't be there. So the more they have on the board, the more likely they can have discussion, get something done. Okay. And Kathy's not here because she's under quarantine. <laughs> we know how that feels, right? Yep, yep. So I'd entertain a, a motion to find an ex emergency exists. So moved. Of a Sorry. second. Ms. Barbara? Wish? Yes. Bradley? Yes. Eden? Yes. King? Yes. Thompson? Yes. Weaver? Yes. I would entertain a motion to approve to adopt the ordinance. So moved. Of second. a second. Ms. Barbara? Bradley? Yes. Eden? Yes. King? Yes. Thompson? Yes. Weaver? Yes. Wish? Yeah. Motion carries. Uh, 6C is Animal Control Inspection Report. David, oh, yes, do we need to appoint the three oh, people? Back up. <laughs> yeah. Kathy has uh, sub submitted the names uh, Danny Alston, Brandon Duff, and Brian Qualls, all three of which are very interested in serving on the board. So do we have a motion to approve those three nominees? Make a motion we approve those three. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Who was the last one? Brian Qualls. Oh. Thank you, Mayor. Oh, sorry about that. Six to C is the Animal Control Inspection Report. Obviously, that's been quite a um, point of emphasis here lately. Uh, so, you guys have seen. A lot of back and forth on this particular issue so I want to give you some history um, originally and I can't remember the date maybe in December 2019 November, 2019 we started the bidding process and we had two bids on the table and we come to the meeting that night expecting to you know, bid those two bids and one of the bidders dropped out and it left us with one bid and Mr. Earls graciously took that contract and has been executing it ever since now, fast forward to this year, which there was a meeting held here in this room um, to which it was not executed properly. It probably left the city in some financial or not financial, but legal jeopardy. So after speaking with the city attorney, uh, I chose to redo that meeting and allow the, the two bidders to be in the room at the same time and one make allegations against the other and allow one to face his accuser directly. So. After that meeting, um, those allegations were found to be uncorroborated, so there was no grounds to seek for a higher bid. By law, claim the mayor's authority is to accept the lower bid without grounds to accept a higher bid. So that's exactly what we did. Uh, there was no grounds, so we moved forward in accordance with the law. Now, once that particular episode was closed out, there was a, an avalanche of complaints that come in through social media and through the city hall to the point where I had asked for them to start filling out affidavits under penalty of perjury. Once that happened, those complaints would drop to zero. There was, there was a few complaints that were submitted. One of them was submitted and notarized by the other bidder in the process. So, Having all of that said, and that history laid before us, one thing I wanted to do was do a fact-finding mission for you, the council. I needed to know what the truth was, and I wasn't getting it locally. It was, it was too convoluted and too biased. So I reached out to a number of parties at the state level to ask where is the state authority for animal shelters and animal welfare. There's some, there's some avenues through USDA, Shane Parker, you probably know as well as I do. There is, there is no state authority. There is no one stop. This is who you call when you have allegations. So ultimately that search led me to Mr. Mike Wheeler. And Mike Wheeler was gracious enough to come in and do a courtesy inspection for Mr. Earls' facility. You guys all have a copy of that. And uh, that's where we stand today. And uh, I'll let 
at that point because it, it had gotten so much political heat behind it. I knew we weren't going to get a true product unless I put someone from this council involved with it to get the truth out. So Judy picked up the, the baton and just ran from there, and I'll let her and I think Shane have some comments he wants to make too from what they found from that point forward. Okay. Um, as David said, we've been having numerous complaints all through 2020 and into the year, so here's where we are. Um, one point I want to make is that when Charles was given the contract, it's a very simple contract, has nothing in there about standards, protocols, how to do the job, what the city expects, other than pick up the animals, get them taken care of, and try to adopt them out. There, there was no detail in that contract for him, so he had no uh, guidelines what was expected. So this, in, this um, inspection that we did was to teach the city what is expected, what our standards should be, as well as Mr. Earls. As soon as that report came in and it was shared with Mr. Earls, he immediately took action to make corrections. He has not made all of the corrections necessary because there hasn't been enough time yet. He has contracted to have a whole new heat and air system put in, even though probably what he had was adequate, but he was going to take it a step up, make it that much better. He's painted the whole floor at his cost of that building, and it's not his building, it's a rental, with epoxy paint to make it easier to clean and be sanitized. He's taken all of the kennels and put tarps between them and behind them because the, tarp, the uh, kennels sit back to back. Uh, just so that the animals can't touch nose to nose and spread disease amongst themselves. So it's a more sanitary condition for the animals. Um, this work that he was doing, um, one fiasco that happened on social media this past weekend is uh, the mayor and I requested Charles to disperse with all the animals, find other shelters that would take them, rescues that would take them, so he could get this work done without having a stressful atmosphere for the animals. So he did that. Someone asked me, are all the animals gone from the shelter? And I said, yes, because I had talked with Charles and they all were going to be taken out, but three got left. So he did his work this past weekend with three still there. Um, but it got out on social media that they were all gone and various people took credit for that. Charles saw it practically the middle of the night, he drove back down to the shelter because he knew he had three dogs there and Facebook was saying that there were none there. So that was just one incident that happened. Um, he's also talked with Mike Wheeler about other issues, uh, partitioning off the washing machine area, uh, partitioning off a quarantine area for animals, which he plans to do. Another issue in the report was torn insulation on the walls that could absorb moisture, become moldy, and be a nuisance. He took his own stock of sheet metal to the building and covered the walls on his own at his own expense. Painting the floor was done at his own expense. He's already talked with Dr. Parker's office about help with uh, intake, outtake forms, and any other forms necessary. Mr. Wheeler is also willing to help him with those forms. The point I'm making is he did his job the way he knew to do it and had no directives from the city. So anything he was failing in is really not his fault. It's all our fault. So now we can correct that, and he can go on, and as, as I said, he's already making all these improvements. There are more to be made, but he has plans laid out to make those improvements. I think he deserves credit for that, credit for the fact that he's put his own money into someone else's building to meet our standards, new standards that he didn't know about before. Dr. Parker, I'll turn it over to you in case you have any other information. Yeah. That you so. I have no dog in this fight, I'll be honest with you. Charles, Charles and I, are we've worked together on all the needing halls since probably the early 2000s, I suppose. Um, I've been a veterinarian since 98. I've been in this community since 
the fall of 99 was my own clinic. Many of you have been in it before, and I'll just go ahead and address, first of all, the, the standards that Mr. Wheeler was expected of Charles. Those standards are apples and oranges to a city the size of Cabot that has basically reserves that are now even close to what Johnson County has mm -hmm. that they can, they can use to fund something like that. And so when I saw that um, report, this was last Wednesday, I had never been to Charles' facility. I actually showed up unannounced to look myself. He couldn't prepare, he couldn't, he couldn't do anything to prepare for that visit. I called him and I said, I'm at your place. How long would it take to be here? He said, two minutes. He showed up. We did a walkthrough. He allowed me to take pictures, which I did. I actually reviewed the report that was given to him and the city. Um, and as I was looking at it, the first thing I thought of was, you can't compare that facility in Cabot, mm -hmm. that Cabot just purchased a 50,000 square foot church mm -hmm. to help house their animals to the size of Clarksville. And I'll, I'll use a... I'll use a correlation to that. In veterinary medicine, there's an AHA organization. And basically, it's the highest standard of veterinary medicine that a hospital can have. If you're an AHA hospital, you make regular hospitals look bad. It's that, it's that good. There's one entrance in, there's one in, exit out. Dogs on one side, cats on the other. I mean, it is extreme, okay? My clinic, some of you have been in, that I think decently ran, mm -hmm. would not even come close to AHA. So for me, looking at that report and trying to compare Charles' facility to the Cabot's facility is just not fair. That'd be like comparing my clinic to an AHA facility. Now, does my clinic still function properly, mm -hmm. still productive? It has for 21 years, and I hope it continues that. Okay? So I took that report as a grain of salt, with a grain of salt. I took it, read it. There are certain recommendations that Charles and I talked about that I felt like need to be addressed. Some of the things that were in that report, my clinic doesn't even meet those standards, okay? I'll be honest with you. He's got bigger cages than I've got my own, my own clinic for your dog, Susan, to be there for the weekend. I mean, <laughs> Many he's weekends. got five by 10 runs, yeah. and mine are four by sixes. So right there, let me know that, okay, we can't really compare these uh, and, and be fair about it, okay? At that point, there was some allegations on social media that the dogs got too cold in that facility that Charles has. I'd like to say this. My recommendation to Charles as a friend was hang a thermometer in the middle of the facility. There was two heaters on each wall, basically, that were controlled, thermostat controlled, okay? The puppies, which he didn't know I was coming out of, were right in front of that. So they got the most direct heat because they had the least body fat. The bigger dogs were toward the middle, which are fine. And I asked him, I said, Charles, I said, there's been some allegations that at 3 o'clock in the morning somebody was walking their dog and they were just felt so sorry for these dogs in his facility that were basically freezing to death. So I said, at 3 o'clock in the morning, I want you to get up tonight. First of all, hang this thermometer in the middle of this, this building, the very middle, the very coldest building. And I want you to come down and I want you to take a picture of it. And I want you to send it to me at 3 o'clock in the morning. And I want the background, your, your phone, watch whatever to show the time, and I want excuse me, people to see that it's your facility. You can see the cages in the background and so forth. 2.53, I get a text. I had three different pictures. Okay, it was 28 degrees outside that night as I looked. It was almost 60 degrees in that facility. Okay, that's roughly what I keep my kennel at, is 60 degrees. One is the body heat from all the animals generated is going to heat it up. Okay, the other thing that I noticed in that facility was this is a storage building that was basically rented and renovated to make into an animal shelter. Mm -hmm. So he's done a lot with what he started with, in my opinion. The other thing is, those dogs are going to freeze to death at 60 degrees. And my first thought when he texted me at 253, I thought, you know what, it's a heck of a lot better than being outside at 28 tonight. Even if it was 45 degrees in there. They still were. They had cover, they had shelter, they had food, and they had water. So, I have no problem with the facility that he has in place right now. I told him the things that he's done to improve that facility, he's jumped through a heck of a lot more hoops than I would have, especially if I had been attacked on social media and had to go through everything that he's had to go through. I can tell you what I would have told everybody, and it probably is not good. So the fact that he's done everything that he has been asked to do, and that's what I've asked Judy and, and David, is there anything that y'all ask him to do? One thing that you said, we need you to do this to correct that he hasn't done promptly. No. There's nothing. No. Okay? And he's in a process of improving things that he wasn't even asked to do. 
Is it the most ideal building? Not necessarily. It's not the most visible, it, you know, as far as that goes. It's not the most accessible, but it's functional. It's like my clinic, it's functional. It's not an aha facility, but it gets done what needs to be done to take care of the animals there. So, the other thing I'd like to address is there was a comment made on social media that <clears throat> all the animals are safe tonight. They've been taken care of. Everybody rest assured the update's been made. I made a phone call immediately to make sure, were those animals still at your place? Absolutely it was. He went back to check them that night to make sure they were still there. Nobody <laughs> came in and, and took them, which has happened in the past in certain facilities. I so bad wanted to get on social media, which I never do. And thankfully for my wife and a choke net, <laughs> wanted to get on there and just ask one question of that person that stated that. Where did the animals go to make them so safe tonight that they wasn't at 6 o'clock four or five hours ago? They were in the same place. And that's the problem that I had, <clears throat> excuse me, with social media. So many comments can be made on social media, and you don't have to back them up whatsoever. Keyboard jockeys that just make statements that do not have to be backed up is what I have an issue with. Mm -hmm. So, I was there at 6 o'clock on Wednesday night last, last week, 28 degrees outside. It was 70 degrees when Charles and I was in there because I looked at the thermometer. It dropped to 60 degrees on a 28 degree night. We don't have much colder nights than that here in Arkansas. He's now got heating and air in place or fixing to be in place. At which I'll say, I asked him who's paying for that. Mm -hmm. He's paying for half of it out of pocket. Mm -hmm. The building owner is paying for the other half. So the amount of money that he's come up with out of pocket, to me, he's done on his own. Nobody's told him to do that. But one last thing I'll say. When he got the contract, he came to me. He handed me a $5,000 check. He said, I'll make a deposit on one. I'm going to start bringing animals. People don't do that. Mm -mm. I don't know if you've been business for yourself. People don't usually say, I'm going to go ahead and pay ahead, Eddie. Here's five grand. It doesn't happen. That's somebody that knows that they're going to take care of what they need to take care of, and they're going to do what, think, what the things that are need to be done to do it right. So I'll answer any questions if anybody's got any as far as protocol and so forth. I might add something to what Judy said. Uh, Judy and I were down there when the inspector came, the mayor. And, uh, you know, I, I've i dealt with dogs all my life. I trained them in the Air Force. And to me, that, that position down there, uh, where they're at, it's off the road, it's away from other people, you know, it's not up in somebody's neighborhood. Uh, and the condition that it was in, I didn't have any problems. The, the only problems I had with it was the cats. Mm -hmm. you know, the cats having to sleep in their own uh, litter box, you know, and I think Charles has taken care of that. I asked him about it. And uh, after we had that meeting, then we went and talked with the inspector, and the inspector sat right there and told us. He said, I've seen a lot of facilities. He said, this is not the worst one I've ever seen. And I said, well, I can take you and show you some that are worse. And, uh, but anyways, to make a long story short, I, guys, I, you know, I'm on the committee. Uh, we probably made a bad decision at one time, but uh, we need to, the main thing is, is Charles is not euthanizing any animal. None, unless they're vicious or they're sick. Can yes. I add to that, <clears throat> So, Charles came to me in the very beginning as well, since you brought that up. Pretty well, this is a no-kill facility. Needy poles, show bay haven. I deal with a lot of rescues, and, and I'm pretty well in no-kill. I'm not going to put, you know, I've kind of gotten known as this little rescue type veterinary facility, unfortunately, because everybody knows I'm not going to put them down. Hey, I found these under the bridge at Scranton, these puppies, and so we're going to take them, I, you know, keep them for a month until we find homes for them. But Charles is no-kill as well. When he came to me with the first vicious dog, basically, or aggressive dog, I should say, he told me, he said, this is your call. He said, because I'm not going to make it when we put this dog down. At that point, we talked, okay, we're going we're to assess the situation. 
nothing gets put down unless it's a major medical reason to put it down or vicious. So he is a no-kill facility, mm -hmm. bottom line. If a dog gets euthanized, I'm gonna take the credit for that. If you wanna call it credit, I'm gonna take the credit for having to make that decision. And I make it upon behavioral and people at risk, their health, or if it's a medically a hit by car, then just the dog needs to be put down because it's been suffering. So the cat situation, basically he wasn't equipped for cats because it was supposed to be the TNRs that he was dealing with, which basically meant he trapped them, brought them to me, I spayed or neutered them, gave them a rabies vaccine, I kept them in my facility for the night, and then still he picked them up the next day and took them straight back and released them into their own environment. So he really wasn't set up for cats in the very beginning anyway. Yeah, and, uh, and those cats that were there were actually TNR cats. When I picked them up, Shane gave me antibiotics because they had upper respiratory, and that's why they were still in the, in the building being treated before they be, was turned back out. I advised him not to release them because they needed antibiotics. Yeah. And I'd also like to say there was a cat that had its leg cut off. Now, instead of putting that animal down, he he chose to to amputate the leg and, and save the animal. So, I mean, you know, that that's what the committee wanted originally. We didn't want we didn't want to be killing animals. We didn't want to be known for that. Still and don't want to be known for it. No. I, I, I really think he's, uh, you know, he, he's learning. He's learning as a, there's a difference between a dog handler and a, and a, a facility manager. Mm -hmm. Facility manager, uh, he has to learn all the, the paperwork and all that stuff. So he's, he's having to learn that. Well, and I think an important point is that we didn't even know. Right. We had right. depended on Needy Paws for years. And they ran a great facility. They still do. But then when it fell back on us, when they withdrew their bid, we had no guidelines to give him. I will tell, I will tell the council this, that um, recently I've, I've emailed Susan and Judy and you, Eddie, all of my history that I've had since I've been here as the mayor for dealing with animals. You guys have every document, every ordinance, every comment that I've gotten from my time here as a mayor it's all in, in in that research that i've done our chat our title six of the municipal code right now says that animal control catches and catches an animal it stays at a veterinary local veterinary for seven days and then it's euthanized that's currently law in clarksville mm -hmm. so that's how old and antiquated it is but it also nor do you have the authority right now to go in and inspect a facility any facility not just charles's any facility that's harboring animals or sheltering animals, we, sh we should have the authority to inspect that children, not mm -hmm. just pick and choose. So as you guys move along with that product, in the end, it's going to come out that's going to be modern, in line with today's best practices, and, and, and be a good product for the animals. Because right now, that's not what we have. It's 30 years old, and it's never been addressed. And hopefully that committee and us together, Shane, you and even you know, Tri-County uh, can help us fix the policy once and for all so that at least at least when my time's done here uh, we'll have left it better than I found it and that's the goal here um, I, I want to get out of the sheltering business a hundred percent if it ain't this year it's next year what I'd like to, like to see this council do is hire an animal control officer for the city and in contract with Needy Paul Safe, Safe Haven um, Nova Star to take the animals that we catch and just get out of sheltering business. Other than inspecting those that are you know, sheltering animals, I, I don't I don't necessarily think we need to be in that business. I think we have we should retain the authority to inspect and make sure that they're taken care of. But as far as having direct oversight of it, I don't think that's something we need to continue. Um, I think we can contract with local vendors that, that are that are expert. They train they're trained, they know what they're doing. Um, Long term, you know, if not this year, then next year. That's what I'd like to. That's the direction I'd like to see us go. That's just my two cents. Can I say something? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, and I am new and taking in lots of information, and I appreciate all the research that you sent us, and I'm I'm still going through it and making notes. And I appreciate you, Dr. Parker, for being here and and the insight that you provided. And I think, I think that's what we probably need more of more often in a lot of our institutions is less keyboard jockeying, I mm -hmm. think you said, and um, 
and more backstops that have actual good information with them. Appreciate you, Judy, for the work that you've been doing on this. Um, I appreciate you, Mr. Earls. I don't know you, but it sounds like you have been really trying to do yes. something here um, and what you do on behalf of those animals. Uh, just as a person who's lived in Clarksville for a long time and has had the errant pit bulls enter my yard from time to time unexpected and <laughs> need to call somebody to pick them up and then hear something like, oh, yeah, I know this one. Like a <laughs> you know, and yeah. it's back again. So, uh, you know, I think we've got some things to work on for sure. Um, I, I hear what you are saying most definitely, but hearing some of the testimony, if you will, tonight, uh, for me, um, I don't think it's fair to Mr. Earls to go back on our contract mm -hmm. when he has put forth such an effort once he found out what he needed to be doing differently. Um, and maybe we don't want to be in that business, but uh, once we've come <laughs> into a contract, we're in a but contract. But we are right now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, maybe that's something, and again, this is just one person's opinion that we need to really continue to look at and look at down the road, but I'd, I'd hate to see us backpedal on something for what at least one of our members has admitted is our mistake. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what I'd like to say about it. Hopefully the mayor will put you on that committee. He, well, they're, they're already on it. It's, it's okay. Judy, Susan, and you. I'm invested. So long term, you know, I think we got the right crew there to steer that and get us the get us the final product we need because right now we're just kind of operating in a gray area, and so are you. One thing, one thing I want to say to you, Charles, is uh, employee employee practices. Um, those have an effect on the city. Uh, you make sure that that's in line with normal fair labor standards, and yes. you're doing things right. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you, real quick. Judy had made the point at the very beginning that the council really didn't know what they were entering into as far as this contract and it's very vague and so forth. The contract to me is bilateral, it's not unilateral, so it can't go just one way. So I can't enter a contract with Charles or you and say, all right, David, you uphold your end, but I don't have to uphold my end. So I think the city has at least some kind of mm -hmm. commitment here that they have to at least honor, in my opinion, from a, from a citizen looking from the outside looking in, that has to be at least obliged. And, and given the chance to, to be remedied. Um, I've always said it, you know, if I'm gonna buy a horse, I'm gonna ride it. And I mean, until it quits riding, then we're gonna, we're gonna change after that. So, you know, we've already made the investment, the city's made the investment, Charles has made money investment out of his own pocket. So I just would hate to see something yes. that should be bilateral with the contract be a unilateral situation. Always I'd be willing to, to, to offer any kind of advice, um, be it, phone calls, council meetings, or whatever, or something. Charles and I, if he has a question, he knows he can text me, be it about medic medication, protocols, intake, outtake situation. Uh, so I'd, I'd like to hear from each council can members. I, yeah. Can I say please, please. Um, I'm totally new at the city council, but I have no background on any of this. So um, thank you, Ms. Weaver, for giving me some background. Mm -hmm. um, well, I came into this meeting tonight thinking that we need to cut our losses as a city and and not have this contract with Mr. Earls because of this terrible report and how you know these animals supposedly have been treated because of all the uh, citizen complaints that I've heard or read. Yes. Okay, um, but I will say that having somebody in the, our community like Shane Parker who's been a veterinarian for a long time makes me realize that we need like Susan said to partner with each other and work this out absolutely yes um at the same time I would say that things have to improve quite a bit you know I, didn't, I couldn't hear you there, Crystal. Things need to improve quite oh. a bit. You know, uh, it wasn't it, just the facility that was mentioned in here. Mm -hmm. You know, the education of Mr. Earls and on on um, uh, on sanitizing busy. and cleaning. You know, what what have you learned since then? Well, something real quick. I want to you know? Sorry. Oh. Is 
the cleaning the cleaning protocol at Mount Clinic is basically something that we're going to move over to his facility as well as far okay. as disinfecting and so forth. There was a comment made that you know you just got to bleach everything. You know, or bleach right. doesn't work. Bleach doesn't work. Yeah. Doesn't work, right. right. Boy, COVID really doesn't work. Okay. <laughs> so uh -huh. I can tell you right now, there's been a lot of studies done with coronavirus, which is a big thing in a, in a facility like that with puppies. That's what mm -hmm. will get transmitted as you walk across the floor and take it over to another kennel. You know, we've talked about baths as far as foot baths and so forth to dip your feet, the soles of your shoes in, your boots, whatever, as you enter and exit the kennel. Uh, that's not something I do in my kennel because I've got set staff that are only ones entering and exiting. When you have the community coming in to look at this puppy at the other end, you bet that needs to be instituted. But Charles and I have talked about that is one part of that report that I agree with. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Not the only part, but one part as far as the disinfecting and so forth. Right. Uh, but yeah, I agree that that has to be addressed. But that's something that we've already talked about as far as is making a change there. Um, there was something about the bleach over by the washer and dryer, and I, I told Charles when I read that, well, I guess I'm doing that wrong too. Uh, because the storage of some of those things is the same way I store them at, at my client. But uh, education-wise, let's just face it. I mean, as far as accolades and, and, and letters behind your name, you know, it doesn't take a lot to do certain things that all of us do day in and day out. You know, I never refer to myself as a doctor. Does that mean I'm not proud of it? No. All of us have a title. So that's something that Charles and I have talked about as far as, no, he doesn't have to have a, a, a college education or anything else to do the things that he's doing effectively. What we will do is partner up together and try to remedy some of those things to make them more effective and just better for the, the animals and the community. Even you guys walking in there. So it is more sanitary and so forth mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. but you're taking a building that doesn't have any drains you got to keep that in mind so he has taken a facility that was like i said a storage building and made it into a shelter and a pretty decent one at that all these shelters that i go to show bay haven that you mentioned a while ago excellent excellent facility excellent girls i should say facilities terrible it's an outdoor facility they are donation only and let me tell you they move a lot of animals and it's all off of donations but their facility is outside. So Charles is set up 10 times better than they are. In their defense, like I said, they're donation only, they're not funded by the city uh, like he is. But yes, those things can be addressed. And I've, I've promised to Charles that I'll, I'll help him all he wants me to, uh, for sure, and the council as well, you know, as far as advice goes. And if that means a, a, a report in X amount of days and you ask me to show up and want me to, you know, give my two cents, I'll be glad to do that too. I think something like that might be nice for the mm -hmm. public, just to show mm -hmm. that we are looking at these benchmarks and, meet, and that you're meeting them in the report. There's nothing like facts to come back and, you know. Well, I, I think the mayor has been hit pretty hard with this and, and, and unjustified because uh, he made the decision to take the low bid, which was recommended by our city attorney and in city business, you always take the low bid if everything else is equal. You know, that, that's just the way you do. You, the, you save, you're a good steward for the city's money. And, uh, but anyways, the mayor, he, he asked for this inspection. He asked for it. And, and he got hammered on social media and everything else. Nobody's picking on me. I don't know why, because I'm the chairman of that committee. <laughs> but, I'm sure they could take care of that. Well, I'm sure that's probably right. <laughs> but uh, but anyways, uh, I would like to say that I, I, I respect the mayor for what he done, you know, uh, and uh, everything uh, as far as the the bidding, that, that was up to him and, and the city attorney. But for getting us somebody up here that would inspect that facility. I guarantee you, if he inspected my house, he would have wrote me up. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, I, the guy was thorough, very thorough. And uh, he's, uh, I know him, he's uh, head of the uh, Animal, Animal, Animal Control, Control Association. Animal Control for mm -hmm. the state, you mm -hmm. know, so uh, he's been around facilities before and he told us, he's. Our facility used to be the same way, but they got lots of money. We don't. We don't have money like Kevin's got. 
Do we need a motion to resolve this? Well, issue? before we move forward, I just want to hear something. I haven't heard from Councilman Wish or Councilman Bradley, and I want to get you on the record, not to put you on the spot, but I want to put you on the spot. Well, I just want to hear your thoughts. Basically, we've already entered into a new contract. Sounds to me as Mr. Earls is meeting the standards of the contract that we entered into. Mm -hmm. So for the term of the contract, we don't have really much to go with. Uh, you know, and as long as we've got with uh, Dr. Parker here working on it and everything and working together and he's satisfied with it, I continue the contract. Councilman Bradley? Uh, ditto. You want to change it? Ditto. <laughs> he said ditto. Ditto. I mean, he's making, he's making a concerted effort to make improvements and we've got a well-respected veterinarian that's working with him. So I, I think we're on the right path. We just, we need to monitor mm -hmm. and come back, you know, next month and say, okay, how, how are we doing? Maybe we need to ask your permission to do that because we don't have that in a policy. <laughs> May we come and check? Yeah. Charles yeah, has been very, 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 very and Charles, you know, Mr. Wheeler did that as a personal uh, favor to me, and it was complimentary. Uh, it was supposed to be an educational um, thing for us all. Well, it was until it got on Facebook. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I am, um, I am, uh, I am dead set against social media. My life has been better since I cut cut that part of it out. Still keep it personal, but I cut out the national news and social media, and I've been a happy man ever since. <laughs> And I think a lot of people in, in this world should do that too. I so. wish it was that easy, but I have to keep the Facebook down there. Well, so I, we just we would need to entertain. I would entertain a motion to continue on with the contract with Mr. Earls. Um, yep. I make a motion so. we continue with the contract that we made with him. We have a second. A second. Miss Barbara. Evans. Yes. King. Yes. Thompson. Yes. Weaver. Yes. We? Yes. Bradley. Yes. Council, I thank you, Mr. Earls. Mr. Parker, I thank you. Um, you're going to find for me that I usually follow the law. Uh, in most cases, I'm going to ask this man right here, hey, I think I've messed up. You know, what do I do? And he's usually going to give me the right advice. And, um, and I do that in all cases. All cases. So if I'm coming to you to talk to you, um, I'm bringing the lawyer with me, okay? <laughs> I just just know that <laughs> Charles you've been more than willing to work with us and I appreciate you very much so all right let's move on 6d uh, Miss Barbara will you read this proclamation please whereas just like those who came before us it is our duty to protect the children of our city and maintain communities in which they are all given the opportunity to succeed whereas we must all work earnestly to create courageous and supportive environments that acknowledge the traumatic past, promote the healing of wounds created by racial, ethnic, and gender bias, and build an equitable Susan. and just society so that all of Clarksville's children can thrive. Whereas children have the right to be provided no, every opportunity to learn, grow, and thrive in nurturing environments that do not violate their safety, dignity, and humanity. And whereas every single person has the opportunity to exhibit an act of kindness to make a simple change within him or herself that can make a profound effect on an entire society. And whereas if we all dedicate ourselves to the principles of truth, racial healing, and transformation, we can all bring about the necessary changes in thinking and behavior that will propel this great state forward as a unified force where racial biases will become a thing of the past. And whereas the racial healing is a vital and crucial commitment to the education, social, mental, and overall well-being of all citizens in the city of Clarksville, particularly children. Whereas the city of Clarksville, in conjunction with others throughout the state of Arkansas, acknowledges January 19th, 2021, as the National Day of Racial Healing and urges all citizens to promote racial healing and transformation in the ways that are best suited for them individually as a means of working together to ensure the best quality of life for every child. Now, therefore, I, David Reeder, Mayor of the city of Clarksville, Arkansas, do hereby proclaim January 19th, 2020 as National Day of Racial Healing in Clarksville, Arkansas, and call upon our citizens, government agencies, public and private institutions, businesses and schools to commit our community to increasing awareness and understanding of racial healing. It's open for discussion if anybody has questions or comments. If not, I just need to 
I make Voter a, affirmation. Make a motion to approve the proclamation. All, right. all, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say the same. Thank you. Okay, moving on with Mr. John from CCU. Okay. By the way, I had some calls from my high school buddies from Paris. They're pretty excited about it. You got them all stoked up over there. <laughs> no, no pressure now. It's not that hard to do when it comes to it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Pam and Thomas had their CCU 101 tours. I think they've got a good feel for what our infrastructure is like and uh, feel like we're moving in the, the right direction. Then the next for Foxville. And even though Thomas has turned before, I don't think they actually had the tour. So I think it was uh, a good call. Um, we have been working with a couple of entities and the city of Salem Springs related to a video zone. You probably know that Clarksville has an opportunity zone within its footprint. Basically everything south of Cherry and west of Spander Creek. Okay? Um, opportunity zones were part of the 2017 tax package and there are tax credits or financial incentives for investment in areas. By far the most investment that's been made across the country has to do with housing and commercial uh, real estate. Not that much has really been done on the industrial side. Okay? There are 8,000 opportunity zones across the country, and I think 80-some in Arkansas, of which Clarksville has one and Silent Springs has one. We were approached by a firm because we were working with uh, another gentleman who was been working on a project with us, uh, the guy who uh, was looking at doing ammonia to energy, okay, about a biodiversity zone, and here's what that means. It means it would be an extra potential layer on the opportunity zone that exists today, okay? Why is that important? There aren't that many biodiversity zones declared in the U.S., I think one, there are several in Canada, but there's a whole level of financial investment that's being made related to biomass and opportunities like that. So what do I mean by biomass, okay? Municipal solid waste is a biomass. We have the recycling center here. Those materials can be used to convert into lots of different uses. We also have lots of chicken litter and turkey litter in the area, or wet or poultry waste, which is entrails from the processing itself, or crops like in the state of Arkansas, rice hull. Okay, so Arkansas, in our area specifically, we think that there's a good biomass opportunity. And if you can go through a process to get declared as a biodiversity zone, you are now on the radar screen because what you've done is you've gone through the process of researching and you've said, the supply you need, developer, is here and you can count on it because that's a big risk for finding a spot. Plus, there's not that many across the country, obviously, so to get yeah. on the radar screen to have one like that would be pretty awesome. We're working through the process. Uh, we met with, um, uh, Representative Westerman, we've met with staffers from Bozeman and uh, Cotton, and they're in the loop because of these opportunity zones went to the federal government. And we've also had one visit with Mike Preston with AEDC and the Department of Commerce. What Mike Preston asked us was, he asked Barry and I, with the other parties not involved, we've got a, a gal named Dr. Rupp who specializes in this, and then a firm out of Canada that specializes in doing the process. He said, tell me what the real opportunity is for this. And the real opportunity is, the need for green and sustainability with this recent election is not gonna decline, it's gonna escalate. Mm -hmm. okay? So all these big companies, Shell, BP, all these big fuel companies, are, need to find an alternative to fossil fuels. That is what they're looking at. Plus, there are hundreds and hundreds of other small and medium-sized companies that are looking for this type of tax benefit. So we are marching through that process. We are now going to go with Siloam Springs and uh, talk directly to Mike Preston because what we want to do is say, this company is going to do the research, it's going to provide some in-kind service, we'll take a share of the cost, and we think the state of Arkansas should take a share of the cost. These are other zones, and I think it's a good precedent. So. A little bit more about that than what you might want to know, but I, I think it's important because it could be a great tool for your economic development. But it's like it's like dealing with biodiesels and 
All, all kinds of biofuels? It could be fuel, believe it or not, they make cosmetics, pharmaceuticals, lots of things from this biomass material. Yeah. Multiple different things. Yeah. Uh, it's a legislative session. Uh, and uh, you've probably heard me say it hundreds of times before. If you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Well, our ANSA group from an electric utility point of view is at the table. Uh, Barry's pretty active in the legislative session um, and the group. One of the things that's coming down the pipe right now is the electric co-ops that are now regulated by the PSC. And of course, municipals are not under the purview of the PSC period. The co-ops are, they don't want to be. They're trying to create a law where they can <laughs> self-regulate themselves. So we'll see how that goes for them. Um, we've had some retirements since we've got that group that's getting closer to that. Well, the most recent one is Jeanette Small. Uh, she retired at the end of the year. A strategic selection that we made a couple of years ago was Craig Frost. Sorry we took him from the school district at the time. Uh, but the, one of the reasons why we did that is so he could come in and get trained in the office behind Marlin and then be prepared for when Jeanette retires. So now he's transitioned into that. COVID, we're in phase one. We have no immediate plans to get out of that until there are 40 active, down to 40 active cases in the county. And then there's the state level that we're targeting before we... Don't get in a hurry. <laughs> I can test. I don't, don't get in a hurry. Yeah. Uh, the electric department and the broadband department are starting to interface with U of O. They started the process of uh, doing the, the science building. In fact, uh, Susan was out there yesterday and I went out there yesterday. We now have the University of the Ozark President's got a new skill. No. <laughs> it's called a track co-op. Oh, wow. <laughs> so apparently they had to get some extra insurance and he told the, told the residential area. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I gotta see the video. Um, I gotta see it. Fiber, out of 4,333 possible customers, and the reason why I say that is normally it's 45, but we have customers that have multiple meters, we have some industrial customers that have three or four. So we get down to the number of customers, we have 4,333 customers, we have 570 drops that are done, which is the box on the side of the house, we have spliced and tested 364. We have actually 200 installs where they're turned up. And the value of those installs and turned up is probably about an annual revenue of 140,000. But we still have about 1,000 to go. And it's a long, tedious process. And we do appreciate everybody being very patient. So we now have all the ponds open except for two. 13 is one that I've been hammering a long time because we made a commitment to try to address the businesses as quick as we can. There's a lot of retail businesses in Palm 13 because it's down Rogers. Mm -hmm. um, and our ozone generator project is off and running, mostly electrical. They hope to be done by March. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good. I, have, I have a quick question, John. Yes. Since the mayor brought it up, and I have friends in Paris too. <laughs> John, I mean, I'm not responsible. For that. <laughs> I've heard you talk a little bit about maybe trying to help them out or join with them a little bit. Um, just give us a quick. Is there any update on that? Or the state of Arkansas, for the first time, started putting dollars towards rural broadband. They started it about a year before COVID and put 10 million of state funds into it. When the CARES Act dollars came down, the governor redirected it out of 90 million towards it, okay? So what has to happen is an ISP has to partner with a city and work on a plan, implementation process, cost to get that grant money. The, the way the grant money would work is we would spend our capital up front and be reimbursed. We looked at doing that at the end of last year, but Congress can't decide on anything and haven't decided whether they're going to roll the CARES Act money over to 2021. So we kind of put it on hold. They have now rolled that over, and I wouldn't be surprised if the next round of stimulus, the governor puts more money. Yeah. Yeah. Of the 100 million, and I think 60 or 70 has been put out there. So. So would you have a contract if, let's say you went into this with Paris or another town and you were that internet service provider, 
to protect the city's finances on this end, you would maybe go into a contract with them on the front end so you're sure you'll get the reimbursement. You would have a contract with the state. Okay. So that you would you would put the cost to build the infrastructure to that underserved part of the community, mm -hmm. and when you turn your expenses in, you'd be reimbursed for it. So uh, Paris was very interested in partnering with us. They had another company approach it, but they like they're they're also one of the 14 municipal electors. Someday I think that they want to own it, and I'd love to see them own it someday so they can control their own. Yeah. We started talking to them, they wanted to partner with us, but guess what, between point A and point B is Scranton and Subiaco. Mm -hmm. Well, as soon as they hear of Paris, they're us too. <laughs> so that possibility exists. And Hartman and Cold Hill is a possibility. We wouldn't be building the network from scratch, they would essentially become like a node, or, you know, the 14 ponds that we designed, they become like extra ponds. Yeah. So we would, I mean, you know, if the state pays 90% of the freight, do it, that is a great return. Yeah. But at the same time, it's us about serving this community. But if we can partner with other cities to help them stand up their own businesses mm -hmm. over time, yeah. imagine how difficult it is for Clark Hill, uh, Cole Hill, and, and Subiaco and whatever. When it comes to revenues for a city, I mean, they're envious of Clark mm -hmm. You know, if they can stand up their own utility sometime, like if they would have done electric 100 years ago, I think it's good for them. So even if they eventually bought the infrastructure from us and oversaw the outside plant, we could still sell them all the backroom services with the routers and all this. So we're open to anything, and I think that that's why they want to work with us. It's about solving problems. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. John, I think, uh, I think what they're looking at, they're kind of like you. They're forward thinking down the road, so they see themselves in whatever point. They have their outlying rural water areas that they already provide water to. That are, that are not going to get served in that first catchment. So they see their expansion. If they stand their own utility, it's theirs, then they can start expanding. So it's a business model. They get it. And, and those are cities, except for Paris, that we already provide most of the water. So we've yeah. got a similar relationship on the water side. Right? Yeah. All right. Thanks, John. Chief? I was going to see if I could borrow Barry. John, you might call him that. You what? You what? Maybe what? See if I can borrow Barry from John for a while, so I can market my way back to the top of the list. <laughs> oh boy! <laughs> That's all right. Though. So now we're starting to. I'm starting to feel like Rodney Dangerfield up here. So the place to park this month or December or offenses was 164. Violations. We kind of dialed things back because we had COVID get running through the PD. Mm -hmm. um, we ended up with about five officers down that tested positive, so we kind of dialed stuff back with dealing with the public and shutting things down as least as we could, but still answer calls. Uh, that's currently going back the other way now. Um, <coughs> then dispatch, they had 4,007 calls last month, which is down a little bit, which I'm not sure if they had anything to do with some of the stuff being shut down. So it helped us, you know, as far as keeping the guys healthy mm -hmm. and girls. Other than that, turning my goals and wish list, don't know on the Tahoes, are we doing that tonight or waiting on it? You talking about uh, putting those deer whistles on the front of them so we don't hit deer? Yes, sir. We, we probably need to I keep think that one's so proud of <laughs> So and for the ones that you don't know, I hit a deer Saturday night on my throat. So insurance and just for being there tomorrow. <laughs> in February, is that what you're saying? You want to do it in February? That's fine with me, sir. So, okay. okay. Let's just do it all at once. Maybe I'll have my first back by then. <laughs> with some deer whistles on it, right? Yes, sir. <laughs> Let me see if Cody's with us. Cody, are you with us? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Everybody can hear you. 
Hey, uh, got a pretty exciting year this so far. Uh, four new small businesses to Clarksville so far this year. Um, U of O is uh, starting an $18 million project. Loves is fixing to start their uh, demo with the six houses. Um, I believe they're going to start breaking ground in March. Um, one new house out on Highway 352 starting this year. So hopefully this year it's going to be a lot busier than last. I turn my goals into you, and that's all I got. Cody, what was your, uh, on the county uh, food trucks, which I consider them a business, what was your total final count for new businesses open in 2020? <clears throat> uh, we had 53, um, I, and I believe there was 15 or 16 that already shut down, which a few of those were our home base. Um, some of them were food trucks. Uh, I, I'd have to get you the names of exactly which ones it was that already come and gone. So you're saying around 40 out of the 53? Yeah, I, I, I believe it was 38 total. Okay. That's not bad during a, during a pandemic. That's not bad, Jessica. That's, that's um, a, a great credit to you and the chamber for that. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Pickup delivery, Grubhub kind of thing that you guys pushed and along with Steven. Um, now, there's, that's where social media is a good thing uh, when it's used properly. Yeah. You can actually yeah. communicate that. So. I, Hopefully next month I will have some really good news for the city. I can't talk about it yet, but uh, something we've been working on for a long time. I discussed with you yesterday. You might as well just tell them because I know it's killing you. No, don't tell them. That, no, I, I, I told the guy I wouldn't tell them. About it. Okay. Hey, uh, I want you to talk a little bit about um, what your role is as a city inspector. What are you supposed to be looking at when you when you go about the city? You know. It, we can't find anybody in violation unless we're driving around looking while we're out doing inspections. Uh, if we if we stop at a resident where there's somebody working, as long as they're doing everything by state law, everything's fine. You know, when you're not operating by state law, we ask you to come in compliance, uh, forward your permits, do the right thing. Um, I want you to just for a second, just a, just to, I want you to especially for the new council members, I want you to highlight some things like the. Uh, the unvented gas hot water tank, the power amperage that was double what the wire was wired. Why do we inspect and look at, the, at those things? I'd make sure they're safe, first of all, foremost. Um, you know, when you have a gas hot water heater that's been TP, the TP valve has been capped off, I mean, that's a mini bomb. Uh, when it's a gas hot water heater and it's not vented, then you're just, you know, you're housing the whole house with carbon monoxide. Uh, we ran across a bunch of those. Um, disconnects after the meter. Um, you know, we've, we've had a bunch of those brought up to code. Uh, there's been some incidents where there's some wire that's run to a duplex where it's 100 amp wire going to two 200 amp services. Uh, luckily, you know, it just burned out a, a meter base and, you know, that's gotten fixed. But we inspect these and we follow the state law on everything we do. So for the council, I don't know if you're any of your constituents have, have said anything to you. Uh, his directive for me is is number one life safety if it's a life safety issue we're not going we're not taking another step until it's fixed um no, you know, and, and life safety issues you know and jason weaver can back me on this one um there's no grandfather in that so life safety issues change they have to be brought up to code to 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 have be like in, under the state law still being under life safeties okay all right thanks cody i appreciate it hey no problem uh, is, is Brian here or Jim? No. Okay, no. Let's see if Jason's with us here. Jason, are you with us? Yes, sir. Okay. Can, and the council can hear you. What's going on with the fire department? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Hey, everything's running smooth. Um, <clears throat> I believe you've got our report. There's not much to report on right now. We're just continuing with trying to keep everybody sharp and trained, uh, but at the same time, you know, uh, do our due diligence and protect everyone from COVID. So uh, besides those uh, extra hurdles to get over, everything seems to be running smooth on our end. Uh, for the new council members, I, I wanted to highlight while Jason's on here, just we've always had, because we're a volunteer fire department, we've always had someone who's of a retirement age, right? And, and has had plenty of time to devote um, 
as the fire chief, right? And they do they do business inspections throughout you know throughout the city. They also they also do reviewing of plans. Well, in a good way, our fire department is much younger. They're but they have they're active. They have families. They're they don't really have the time that our retirees had in the past. So we chose uh, this past December, I think, Jason. Just you correct me if I'm wrong. To kind of take a committee approach. So when we have Jason. Weaver, Jeshua Reeder, and um, Larry Vanover are kind of running that department, and the three share the load at the top. So when one of them's not available, one of the other two are. And so far, I think overall that has been received really well and it's working well. Jason, you might you you can elaborate on that if you want. Sure, you bet. So I I took the chief's position, and then I've got Jeshua Reeder as a deputy chief and then Larry Vanover as an assistant chief and to a lot of people that didn't know our current situation it might sound heavy at the top uh, that we've got too many officers but it really works well for us uh, thus far since we've started this having three different chiefs uh, is going to allow us to have a, a chief level command presence at nearly all of our calls uh, some of you don't know, I work at Russell Fire as well and work a, uh, a schedule where I'm there every third day. So there would be concern that, you know, I can't get everything. And so I can lean on the two other guys. So amongst all three of us, whether it's a meeting or an emergency incident, we can always have a, a chief present. So it works well for us. And, and also, when it comes to the day-to-day -day tasks, as far as inspections, uh, getting reports out to people, plan reviews, things of that nature, having three of us, we can share that workload. Uh, and it, it seems to be working really well. Okay. I have a question for Cody and for uh, Jason. Cody mentioned that uh, Loves is starting demolition. Yes, on those six properties that they bought. Yeah, mm -hmm. I thought we were going to allow the fire department to use those houses when, before when, demolition. When applicable, right? If there's no time constraint. Okay. Uh, if it, if it's a house that's no hurry to, to be demoed, um, that's not a problem. But, but they are now, they, since they've, they've already wasted so much time, we're not going to. Now, if Jason, if uh, if Loves, Cody, work with, work with Loves and if... Um, <laughs> If uh, Loves is willing to let the fire department, you know, do some roof entrance training on one of those houses, you know, work it out. But don't you hold that yeah, absolutely. I actually I talked to Jason today. Uh, they're still in the bid process of uh, finding who they're going to go with on demo those houses. They've done the last abatement study today uh, for the house to see if they have asbestos. So hopefully by the end of the week, we'll actually know who's going to pull demo permits, which Jason will have to sign off on also. Okay. Thank you. Don't you hold that project up. <laughs> All right. Thanks, you guys. Stanley? Well, as of today, we finally had all of our crew at work. In the <laughs> since that's happened, I think we've had three different people out of the code. <laughs> and, so like, and none of them got it from the other. So we don't know where it's all coming from. But we have finally got railroad shoulders and stuff put on there. I think it's the, rightest, the widest railroad has ever been. I've, Looks we may good. have speeding problems out there now, but it's <laughs> the lines that slow traffic traffic on. But uh, we have installed, I think, three different culverts so far for residents around town, fixing the work on Stigall Road. Uh, we had a company come out and look under the pipe under the levee before we do the levee raising. It's got to have a pipeline under it. It's around 50 grand to do is what he estimated it cost, what he bid it out, of course. But we want to do that before we. Well, while you're fixing the levee, you fix it. It's going to be good before we do anything, you know, have to build the levee up and tear it out again. So basically that's it. We have a lot more. To, with everybody back, we're going to be able to catch up a lot of things we've been missing out on. Okay. Um, I, gave, I, gave, um, I gave all the department heads a keyword for the year. What was that word? Was I here? You remember? <laughs> Staffing. What was the word for the year? Aggressive. You are, aggressive that's right. We are going. We are getting after projects this year. We're going to. We're going to throw asphalt, concrete. We're, going to, we're looking at five hundred thousand dollars at least trying to do some payments yeah. this year. We 
But it won't last long. It'll go pretty quick. So expect a lot of disruption in your neighborhoods because uh, they're coming. They're, they're coming with a storm behind them. Have y'all applied for any uh, of the state funding? No. I know uh, we talked about that with the guys what, when we were doing the levy. Yeah, we've got, uh, you talk, you, Eddie, you talking about for the levy project? No, no, no. For the, the, road. the state road fund. Mm. You mean a street? You're not talking about street improvement, though, right? No, I'm talking. Well, yeah, street improvement. Though. Yeah, we still have. Well, Barbara, what was the last 3.4? No, he's talking about like good. No, roads. I'm so talking about good roads. Road. Oh, something yeah. out. Yeah. We'll get maybe a four in the Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there's there's a lot of money. And, you know, you talked with uh, Jerry Bowen. Jerry's uh, the state administrator. Mm -hmm. There's something else Stanley brought up to me at the first of the year was our street lights. You get up to a million dollars. Well, we might need to start looking at some funding streams. We have about four outdated traffic lights that we need to update. About 100,000 in the intersection. Hmm. <laughs> they're working, but they're old. We're constantly repairing them. <laughs> Not this cheap anymore. Wow. Stanley, you guys are doing a good job. We're trying, um, like I said, just not to have a full crew back. They built, built, they built that road for the core, you know, core engineers mitigation out there. I don't know if y'all seen that around the sewer ponds. John, that's probably going to help you. Uh, CC, you, know, <laughs> you guys can access that road now. It's a good road. It's probably one of the better roads in Clarksville. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully, all the fog comes up. That's what's going on. Okay. Anything else? That's it. Call state aid money. State aid money. State aid. We'll look into it. Max? Yes, sir. Uh, we are uh, the Aquatic Center. We're back open as of this weekend. Uh, we actually have a, we're going strong. We actually have a, a swim meet there tonight. Um, and um, I think I think we're good moving forward as far as um, all of our classes and programming um, are being close to those two weeks. Gave us a great time to, uh, to do some training and some deep cleaning. Um, and we're going to continue with a lot of those cleaning protocols um, and, and very strict sanitizing protocols. And I think that'll um, do the best we can to keep everything safe. Uh, but also functioning and full, full op fully operational. Um, we have a we have a lot of uh, great things in the pipeline. Um, one thing I want to highlight um, is the community garden. Uh, that I, I guess it's been sitting empty for a little bit. Um, we have uh, we actually have a meeting tomorrow to form that advisory board. Um, Stephen's helping with that as well. Um, and we, I'm really looking forward to the soft opportunities out of there. The high, the high school, Clarksville High School FFA Club is going to take over operation of a section of it. Um, and we'll also have plots open. It's for, good to see uh, that coming back yes, revived. Exactly. Yeah. Plots open for community users as well. Um, but there's also going to be a lot of um, educational um, and agricultural education um, programming opportunities as well. We can get out there, you know, outdoor classroom and workshops. Uh, for gardening and agriculture and um, education, uh, that I'm looking forward to is programming, as well as you know events like um, I mean with the uh, farmers market um, and possible you know, co-op arrangement as well. Um, and we, I um, uh, know you know it feels like it's already been a while since Christmas, but uh, I just wanted to publicly say um, that you know we had a great Christmas and client event. I hope you guys were all able to make it out. Um, thank you to A and P. Um, and the chamber, it was a great group effort. Um, we, um, we had about um, approximately uh, 1,500 um, attendants. We did have to cut, uh, cut it short a couple of weeks, uh, shut down, but uh, we had about 1,500 attendants um, as our attendants. Um, and we're still working as far as our, our final net revenue, but um, uh, since with the cut short, um, um, especially since um, we had that funding from AMP. We we did break. I believe we did break even as far as costs. Um, but you know the point wasn't to make money. It was to create a, a magical winter wonderland. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like we achieved that. Yeah, you did. So thank you to everybody involved there. Um, we uh, like I said we have we have a few other things in the pipeline. Um, we've got um, focus on our, our biking trails and our bike culture. Um, Stephen and I have been working on that, and uh, we have a, a pretty. I'm excited to have a meeting at the forum kind of advisory board with that as well tomorrow. Um, my one final thing I wanted to say, when I submitted my um, goals and objectives for the year, which for myself, since I'm still fairly new, was, was I kind of wanted to include a lot of broad things in big picture as well. Um, 
I also included a new uh, mission statement for the Parks and Recreation Department. I wanted to read for y'all. Um, I think you know it's important uh, to really define the the direction in a big picture way of, of where we want to go as a department. How it's going to be done for y'all. It's uh, the Clarksville Parks and Recreation um, Department's mission is to provide hospitality and recreational opportunities that promote happiness, health, and fitness and outdoor recreation to our citizens and visitors of all ages and abilities through our inclusive, high-quality parks, facilities, and events while creating opportunities for growth and tourism in the city of Clarksville. I don't sure if that's included in you guys. Hopefully, um, hopefully that, uh, that covers all of what we're trying to do in the direction we're trying to go. Yep. Any questions about anything? Mm -hmm. uh, if anything I didn't mention, Okay. Aggressive, right? Yes, sir. Get after it. <laughs> Robbie, you, Robbie, are you, Robbie, are you with us? Robbie, are you there? Yep. Now, you, now I hear you. All right. Talk a little bit about the MPB and parks. Okay. Um, I got one phone call today. Um, we sit there and we have booed. Robbie? I bet we lost him. <laughs> <laughs> Done knocked him out. I'd have hung up on that one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Robbie, you have to unmute. There you go. Are you there? Did it work? Yeah. Yeah, I'm there now. <laughs> it was on our side. I'll what? What, uh, what did the? What did you get? Uh, nothing. <laughs> nothing. Beginning well, again. Start off. I had it. Start <laughs> over. You got a phone call. I had it. <laughs> yeah, I got a phone call today from a guy that has a lot of softball tournaments, and he um, has booked probably about eight weekends from starting about the 1st of March until about the 1st of June. And if he, um, you know, covers those eight Saturdays, then we'll have every weekend book for softball tournaments from the 1st of June until the 1st of, well, until the 1st of March. That's, that's good. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. And um, I'll get with Max, and we just need to decide on whether or not, you know, how we want to do the, the cut, you know, the COVID stuff, you know, do we limit the amount of people coming in, um, that stuff. Well, you've got the Department of Health guidelines, you just follow those and you'll be fine. Okay. Hey, speaking of that, um, have you and Max submitted the, uh, the mowing bids yet? Do I have those in my inbox? Uh, you have, the, um, you have the, the first draft, so we got a comment from you this morning to, to an interview. Did you catch that? No, I didn't. Yeah, I got it. Okay. Um, I'm going to get with Max tomorrow, and we'll just finish up the, you know, we, we started on it, and, you know, we need to make some changes. So tomorrow I'm going to get with him, and then we'll sit there and make some changes and, and get it submitted to you. Okay, all right. Awesome. Can I make a, a comment or ask you a question regarding the, the tournaments possibly coming up? Um, I live in that area, mm -hmm. and I walk over there, and I... I love to see all the people and everything, it's, especially if we can do it safely. Um, and something we, you guys are probably thinking about, but we, we definitely need to, is do we need to have any kind of limit or rule on how many travel trailers can <laughs> Robbie, what have we been camp about for the night, uh, a series of nights in the parking lot? Yeah. Robbie, you want to, Robbie, we you, have, know, yeah. you want to talk about the project? We, we have to probably get with John Lester and See what we can do over there. <laughs> right. You know, we talked about this for years, and, and uh, I think it's about time that we might need to do something. But uh, we got a little section of property over there on the south side of the that electric substation over there by mm -hmm. the sheep plant. And we kind of talked about maybe, you know, thinning that out a little bit and making that to a little RV park for the travel trailers for the softball tournaments. Mm -hmm. I think um, we had a softball tournament. I think it was around Halloween, and I think I counted probably Saturday morning we had 18 
got parked in the parking lot there. <laughs> wow. And then where would be the closest dump station? I'm very practical. <laughs> Most of these RVs that are coming are used to just parking in Walmart parking lots. And they're they're usually yeah. usually yeah. dumping stations. Officially, the nearest dump station, John, correct me, it's going to be Spadder Park, right? Spadder Park. I don't think it's Spadder Creek. progress that you've seen over here, the way that you tidied up the building mm -hmm. uh, and the work that you do. Eddie was talking about it before the meeting about how much stuff gets piled on you, especially on a holiday weekend. Oh, yeah. It's yes. incredible. If you go yeah. do a before picture on Friday and everything looks neat and tidy and you go back on Sunday, mm -hmm. it's mounded over. And it's incredible, Chris, what you do. I'm really proud of you. Well, I, I get help from the parks and when I'm... Yeah, yeah, they all help. Okay. Me. That's what's good about the whole staff. They're not afraid to help each other. And so it's good, really good. I appreciate it very much. Max, I want to go back and highlight one thing to state publicly. Um, if there is anyone, any school district, college, whatever, who wants to hold a swim meet in Clarksville, Arkansas, that facility is open mm -hmm. and we are ready for business. All they have to do is send it our way. I agree. And, you know, we're already known as, as one of the better facilities for meets in the area. So yeah. I, I think that's a really point of, point of pride for the community. Uh, just make sure everybody officially knows that. Um, uh, Brent's not with this. Steven? Sure. Oh, you want to? You want to do that first or after? Sir? That's up to you. I'm just okay. getting ready. You tell I'll me just, I'm going to breeze through my little break here real quick and then we'll just play that off and I'll, uh, I'll let y'all get back to your lives. <laughs> um, one of the focuses I have for this coming year is to build uh, uh, workforce development programs that satisfy the needs of our community. Uh, every community is different, and you know um, we need to work with our local business owners, uh, especially industry, uh, to build a workforce development program that is providing a skilled workforce that is tailored to Clarksville and the general needs of our of our uh, regional workforce. One of the ways we can do that is by taking advantage of the ACT Work Ready Program. Uh, Jessica and I were chatting about this earlier, um, and I had a Zoom call with the administrators of that program uh, earlier today, uh, and. West of Pulaski County, ACT certified communities are far and few between. Uh, it seems like the east side, eastern side of the state gets all the attention, um, but I would like us, by the end of 2021, to become an ACT certified uh, county, at least at the bronze level. And there's a, a variety of levels that go like the platinum. Um, not only that, uh, I want to take the opportunity uh, to host one of their boot camps here. Uh, it would be it would bring in a number of economic developers, chamber executives, uh, uh, industry leaders uh, to take advantage of the program where they can train right here in Clarksville. I think it's a good marketing and networking opportunity for my office, for the chamber, and for Clarksville at large. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's going to be one of my priorities. I'm going to work hard and aggressive towards that, as the mayor was saying, um, uh, as well as uh, another uh, workforce development uh, opportunity um, was Lean Six Sigma. If you don't know what that is, it's, it's, uh, it's a useful uh, program for for industry. Uh, it, it's it's a way to make systems and, and pro, uh, programs more efficient. Uh, and something I took advantage of when I was in the Marine Corps. I hope to bring that here for some of our uh, professionals in in Haynes and Tyson's and the other large companies here in Clarksville. Uh, Max hinted on the community garden. We're getting ready to establish an advisory board for that tomorrow. We'll meet with some folks that are interested in participating. Uh, you know. It, Community garden seems very, you know, basic on the superficial level, but uh, you know, it, it's 
community development plays hand in hand with economic development, business development. So uh, growing this community garden provides opportunities for our citizens that otherwise wouldn't exist. Educational opportunities, uh, we can get involved with the Department of Ag through the Farm to School program where students are actually growing their own food and then serving it to other students in their cafeteria. What if we took that a step further and some of the residents that were leasing or renting one of those plots were then selling their organically uh, locally grown produce to local restaurants. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can build a certification program around that that says, hey, this is you know, locally made produce that our restaurants are, are mm -hmm. selling to customers. Um, and then going beyond that, we've talked about a co-op and we've already had discussions with some other communities that have stood up successful co-ops that are, um, if not profitable, relatively neutral at least. Uh, I think that's something that will benefit our community greatly. Uh, so I'm looking forward to uh, going down that path. Cycling infrastructure, we have uh, lane shift out of Bentonville. If you know anything about cycling culture in Northwest Arkansas, it is a big deal. Uh, in fact, I think Arkansas is one of the leading states in the cycling culture around the country. Uh, lane shift has some inroads with uh, various funding streams and expertise. I know the Lone Foundation is one of them. Uh, we're gonna, we're gonna, you know, uh, ask as many questions as we can in that meeting and see how we can best leverage the infrastructure we currently have and how it can be improved and build a, um, a cycling culture here in Clarksville that is, you know, successful. Um, something else we might consider doing is working with the NECA uh, group to have competitive racing for our high school students. Mm -hmm. I'd, like, I'd love to see that. So we're bringing in some uh, local cyclists to help kick that off. Strategic study, um, you've heard me talk about this for months. Uh, Thursday is our first meeting to actually kick that, that study off and uh, uh, you know, hopefully pull out some good data that can, that can carry our city through the next decade. Um, and uh, you know, speaking of which, uh, I have to thank Dr. Scott over at the University of Ozarks for supplying an intern because this is going to be a pretty you know, labor-intensive project uh, and uh, we were able to secure an intern. I